and I get the mouse. Now recording. Good morning. This is Richard Miller. I'm Library Development Director here at Nebraska Library Commission. And Laura Johnson, who is the Continuing Education Coordinator, is also here. We'll both be speaking to you today. And thank you, Krista, for helping set this up. This is the second last workshop that we're doing, actually, and the only online version of the workshop that we're doing on the new accreditation guidelines and on strategic planning. And that's what we'll be talking to you about today. Uh, both of us have been on the road quite a bit. Uh, some of them I've done by myself. Some of them Laura and I have done together. This will be recorded, as you know, so that people can come back to it if they weren't able to get on today, even though they registered. It will be archived, so you can look at this at a later time. The accreditation and strategic planning workshop that we'll be doing today should allow you as a board member, as a planning group member, as a library director or library staff member to work toward the accreditation guidelines if your library is up for accreditation this year or for reaccreditation. Even if it's not, this will be handy for you to look back at and we'll be introducing you to the other materials that we have on the website that will really help you do this process. So I'm going to start talking about the, uh, the, we call them the new accreditation guidelines. They actually were used for the 2013 process and now are going to be used for the 2014 process. Before I start, let's see if Laura would like to add anything to what I've said. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, no, I think Richard's about covered it. We're going to try to uh, cover accreditation and strategic planning. Our, our hope is that we can, um, when we put this up, when we archive it, that we will have some midway points where you could start to just take one little section of it, if you like. So uh, we're going to kind of do this in sections, and um, we hope that you find it very useful. We're sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Click over onto the, um, there you go, and you should be able to save. All right. There are uh, the email addresses for Richard Miller and Laura Johnson. They're very easy to use in case you need to contact us for anything. And what we hope to accomplish today is, is are these outcomes for the workshop. You can read them yourself, but basically we're going to familiarize you with the accreditation guidelines. We hope that you'll understand the connection between the accreditation guidelines and strategic planning. If you haven't gotten it by the end of the workshop, we haven't done our job, so we hope you'll get it. We hope you understand that the guidelines are also useful for a number of other things, including planning, and we'll draw some examples for you, and as benchmarks to measure your library against other libraries of similar size, either in Nebraska or elsewhere in the United States. Come on. So the new accreditation guidelines. Maybe we have to take the new off there. I'm not sure, because they were new last year, but I guess if they're new, if you haven't used them before. So that's what we'll be talking about. The new accreditation guidelines are based on community needs. I want to talk for just a little bit about the group that worked with us at the Commission to put together these guidelines. Uh, it was made up of, I'm going to list their names because they did yeoman's work on this whole thing. The group was chaired by Stan Schultz, who used to uh, be the library director at Kilgo Memorial Library in York. And the vice chair was Joan Burney, who is the library director at Broken Bow. We also had Francine Canfield from Ralston at the Public Library, Kendra Kasky from the Public Library in Ogallala, Robin Clark from the Public Library at Papillion, Brenda Ely, who was then director of the Southeast Library System, Amy Hafer, although she was called Greenland at that point, from Hastings Public Library, Pat Leach from Lincoln City Libraries, and then the staff that worked with us here, of course, Laura and I were involved in this from the very beginning, as was John Felton, who is our Planning and Data Services Coordinator, and then Linda Jensen and Janda Greaser, and we have to give credit to Vern Bias, who's our head IT guy also, for putting together these guidelines. We all worked very hard on this. Uh, they were presented to and then approved by our Nebraska Library Commission, our six-member gubernatorially appointed uh, commission that governs us here, and they were in use for the first time last year. Now you guys are the lucky guys. If your library is up for accreditation this year, the reason we are doing these workshops so early is so that you have as much lead time as you need. And actually what happens here is that uh, my office contacts your library sometime in early July, 
around July 1st if your library is up for accreditation or reaccreditation. And then you have until October the 1st to complete the accreditation guidelines and to uh, send us your strategic plan. So that's kind of the basis of the whole thing. Now, based on community need, one of the things that the group who worked with us said is that they felt that the guidelines that we used to have were not really based on and customized for individual communities, and they didn't really fit a number of communities that we have. So the conclusion that was reached by that group, and we concur with it from the commission here, is that there, have, there has to be some planning on the local level that reflects your community needs. So that's why we have this slide up there. And that's why we'll be talking to you about doing strategic planning. That's the link between these two. You really have to do strategic planning in order to do these accreditation guidelines. And you'll see the links as we go through describing the accreditation guidelines. The other thing that's very different about these guidelines is that under the old guidelines, for those of you who use them, you know that there were three levels, essential, enhanced, and excellent levels. And you had to complete one level before you could move on to the next level and then complete the first two levels before you could move on to the third level. There were elements, there were guidelines in there that would knock a library out from moving on to the next level. With these guidelines, which are based on total points, you can make up for deficiencies in some area by earning points in some other areas. There are approximately 275 points in these guidelines, and I say approximately because you can earn some extra points on some of these guidelines that might take it above 275 total points. But in the way this is structured, the three levels are bronze, silver, and gold, which we give credit to for uh, to Laura Johnson, who came up with these three levels, somewhat half-kiddingly, but everybody loved the idea. And with the Social Olympics coming up in less than two weeks, I think everybody understands what those levels are. The bronze is the beginning level, and then the silver level is next, and gold. In order to attain those levels, you see the point totals that are required, 250 for gold, 200 for silver, and 175 for bronze. Let's talk about the features of the accreditation guidelines themselves. First of all, another interesting feature and new feature about this is that instead of the old guidelines, which had uh, somewhat arbitrary population groupings, uh, that individual libraries would have to meet based on their LSA, their library service area population. Now you'll be comparing yourself with like-sized libraries with populations up to 15% larger through 15% smaller than your particular LSA, library service area population. Now when you look at, uh, this is a picture of one of the uh, pages from the guidelines, the very first part of it, the instructions for the whole thing. And what this does is that you can view those libraries that you are going to be compared with here. Now most of our public libraries in the state are going to be compared with other public libraries in Nebraska. But, thank you, but some libraries in our state do not have enough peer libraries to be compared with, and so we have, in some cases, pulled in public library statistics from Iowa. And in fact, in some libraries in the northern tier of the state, we have pulled in some public library statistics from uh, South Dakota as well, and other states. Now, in this case, we're looking at McCook Public Library, and the comparison libraries there, you'll notice there are some from Nebraska. There's Ralston and Crete and Seward. But then there are some from Iowa as well, Orange City, uh, Adele, Carlisle, and so forth. And you'll notice also that instead of, one of the problems we had with the old guidelines was that if you had, let's say, population categories of 0 to 500 and 501 to 1,000 and 1,001 to 2,500, whatever it was, libraries tend not to be in the middle of those categories. They tend to be, some of them tend to be on edges. And they would make the argument about saying, you know what, we're one person over into the next largest population, we can't meet those guidelines. Well, what this peer library comparison does <clears throat> is that it puts your library right smack dab in the middle of the libraries that you're going to be compared with. You're right there in the middle. There should be a pretty equal number above and below your library. So that's the peer libraries. You'll notice that there was a, that peer library group was a live link. You can go to this and see what, what it is for your particular library. And one of the things about this is you'll notice and we'll talk about this again later, is that 
each application for these accreditation guidelines is customized to your library only, not other libraries, because your statistics are fed into this, and we'll talk about that in just a second. No double reporting. For those of you who've done this before, you know that uh, each year you send in your annual statistics, your public library survey, to John Felton on our staff. And then what happened in the past was that if your library was up for accreditation or reaccreditation, sometimes you forgot what figures you reported, didn't have a record, or had to rethink that whole thing. Well, what happens now is that those statistics, which you know, of course, are due on February 14th, Valentine's Day, easy to remember <laughs> this year, those statistics are fed into the guidelines themselves, <clears throat> and you don't have to report those again. There are nine guidelines which uh, compare you with other peer libraries. I said 12 the other day, but it's nine. I looked it up. There are nine guidelines, and those are automatically fed in there, which you will see when you turn in your Bibliostat Collect uh, statistics using Bibliostat Collect. For example, in this one, you'll see that this guideline under collection 2.0502 and 2.0504 and 05 and 06 are already filled out before the others are checked. In this case, um, in those four areas that you see there, uh, there'll either be a green check mark or a red X. If there's a green check mark, it means that your library has met or exceeded those of your peer libraries. So we'll take 2.0504 specifically because there are no figures listed at the one above. In 2.0504, it's talking about how much money your library spends on materials in the library as a percentage of your total operating budget. In this case, the peer average is 13.52% and the peer median is 12.31%. This library, McCook Public Library, spends 17.2% uh, of its operating budget on materials, so they're well above. They either have to meet or exceed either the median figure or the average figure, and they have exceeded it, so there's an automatic green check in there. Now look at the one immediately below it, 2.0505. This talks about the annual circulation. Well, the annual circulation figures the, the, from the peer libraries is 2.90 for the median and 13.05 for the average of those libraries of like size. And since this library falls below there, there's an automatic red X put into that box because it did not meet it. Remember, these are from statistics you sent in. Also remember that the ones that we're looking at here are the 2011-2012 statistics. The new statistics that you're going to be sending in by February 14th will be in the new form sometime after July the 1st when you have to apply for uh, these accreditation guidelines. So that's how it works. Some years ago, the figure that we used to have here to compare your library with was... Uh, in some cases based on average, and we added the median figure under the old guidelines. This gives you two chances to meet that. So the other thing that these guidelines do is they offer some, some context help. Uh, if you look at the form itself, you'll notice that there is a question mark in a yellow ball. I remember to click that time. Which will take you to a help page, and in this case, this has to do with weeding, so if we click that, it actually takes you to the section of the help page which talks about weeding. Now this help page, you can expand and print the whole thing out if you want to or look at the whole thing if you'd like to, but this does take you to the exact section that you would want to look at. it. So it will answer questions, it will help with definitions in some cases, it actually will replace what we did under the old guidelines which consisted of hundreds of emails that I used to send to libraries saying, what are you talking about on that particular thing? This explains what we're talking about. And Laura did a lot of work on this help page, and we increased the visibility of the question mark in the yellow ball this year because some people didn't see it last year. The other thing that this does is that as you look at the forms itself, as you're going through here, we told you that this is based on the total points. Instead of your having to count the points up manually or to look back where you were, there's an automatic point total that occurs, and this box follows you down the page as you're clicking on things. Do I click again? All right. That's what I want. Okay, so the points are there as you go through. 
So this saves you work. If you want to, you can go through this thing and you can, uh, instead of sending the application, you can save it and resume it later. Now right now, if you attended, attempted to send in the application, you get a big red box that says it's not available for sending in right now. So you should uh, save and receive uh, for later. Your name of your library, the name of the library director, and the email are at the end here, which is a double check to make sure we have this up-to-date information and also helps us so that we don't have to scroll up to the top and see which library we're talking about. When you save and resume later, what you put in there should be saved, of course, for later. And uh, it does help save time. Now, there are 12 minimum qualifications. One of the things that this group that we worked with said to us was, the old guidelines are a mixture of mandates and suggestions and hints and everything else. But they felt that there are certain minimum requirements that every library should meet before they even apply for accreditation. Those appear on the website itself, and there's a link there to the 12 minimum qualifications. You have to check all 12 of these saying that you meet these, and this is, of course, self-reported. And I'll go over, there, over those in just a, a little bit here, but this is self-reporting that you meet all these guidelines and you're saying, you're verifying that you do that before you can move on to the application form itself. You can preview the application form, but that's not a live version of the thing. To get to the live version and to get to your libraries, you have to check all 12 of these, which I will do now. Well, I have to go live first. Yeah. Okay. Is it on the next slide or do I have to no, go live? No, this okay. is how to get to the form. All right, we're going to get to the form here. Ah. Here, just go down to all the way to the right of the browser. Here? Yep. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Now, now we're live. Okay. On the form itself, we've been talking through a number of these things here and uh, telling you about the things. Now we're going to go down and actually go to the 12 minimum qualifications here, which is how you get into the form. It's one of the ways to get into the form. Now we will check all 12. First of all, you're indicating that you're legally established under state statute. That means under Chapter 51 for most of our libraries, but perhaps under Chapter 16 or 17 if you're a larger public library. We'll check that. You say that you comply with all Nebraska library laws, regulations, as well as state, local, and federal laws. If the federal government gets around to changing minimum wage from the 725 or whatever it is to 1010, you'll have to be following that. It says that your library has either a governing or administrative or advisory board and that that board operates under the Open Meetings Act. And for those of you in some of our smaller libraries, make sure that you understand that you have a governing or sometimes called administrative library board. You do not have an advisory board. We have a number of libraries who think they have advisory boards that do not. So if you're unsure of that, check with us. Only in cities of the first class, which would be 5,000 population and up, do those libraries have the option of have, having either a governing library board or an advisory library board, and most of them have governing at this point. So, you're checking that. Your board is certified. If you don't know what that means, that means that they have to have earned 20 hours within the last three years, and you can check with Laura Johnson on that. If you need to be, or you don't know if you're certified, you can check with her because she handles board certification. Your library director has to be certified at the required level, and you can check with Laura on that. Would you like to talk about that now or later? I can talk about that later. Later. She'll talk to you about that. So anyway, your board and your director are both to be certified. You have to receive local funding from either your village or city or township or county, depending on which area you're serving or which areas you're serving. You have to have submitted your most recent Bibliostat uh, Collect uh, statistics through Bibliostat Collect. If you have not done that, you cannot do this survey or the, these accreditation guidelines because those statistics are automatically fed into that. You have to pay staff and have paid staff on duty all the open hours of the library itself. Your director has to have an email address which is used regularly. And you can define regularly, but it certainly should be no less than probably once a week. You have to make your basic services available to all the people in your taxing area. 
and basic services are defined in the state statutes. And I wish they were more extensive than this, but this was passed years ago. So you have to extend services free to your tax base for circulation of materials, of print and non-print materials, for reference information, and for information services. You have to provide internet access to anybody who walks into your library, whether they're part of your tax base or not, at no charge. And you have to make an annual report to your governing body, your local city council, village board, county commission, or township board, in order to report on the state of your library uh, each year. And that's the first Monday in February of every year. Either your board chair, which is probably preferable, or the library director should be doing that. Check the state statutes under Chapter 51. If you have questions about Chapter 51, you can contact me. I'm not an attorney, but I know the library laws inside and out. I'll give you the citation to the proper thing. Make sure that you do that. You have to be able to check all of those. Then, once you do that, it says, based on the responses above, you meet the minimum qualifications, and you may choose to apply for accreditation. You hit that, and then at this point, you have to put in your user ID and password that you use to put in the statistics using Bibliostat Collect. And we are using a username and password from a Cook Public Library, so please don't cheat and try to use this because uh, the library director there won't be happy, but she has allowed us to use this. And then we'll log in and get to the application form itself. Now, you saw some pages of this before. We're going to scan through this a little bit to familiarize you with the form itself. We've talked about some of the features already. You'll notice the floating point total in the upper right as we move up and down. It follows you along to tell you how many points you've accumulated. You'll notice here what I told you about if you meet some of those nine Guidelines where you're compared with your peer libraries, if you meet them or exceed them, there's a green check mark. If you don't, there's a red X. To get to your peer libraries, you can click on that View Peer Libraries and get to the peer libraries, and you've already seen those for McCook. So we will get out of that. If I close this, will I get back where I was? Where's the back button? It doesn't look live. How do I get back? Oh, it's the other. Is it tab? This one? The other tab. Okay, thank you. All right, so you can view your peer libraries if you wish to. And you can print those out and look at them. And you can actually look at their statistics if you want to. Uh, each uh, item in these guidelines has a line that talks about the library goals. And this is one thing that we have to hit. This is another connection between your st strategic plan and the library goals themselves. You'll notice that for most of these guidelines, as we'll see, you have to indicate which part of your strategic plan addresses that guideline if there is something in your strategic plan that addresses it. So not every guideline may have a citation, but you'll put in something like Part 2A or some shortened language from your strategic plan. Uh, we told you about the connection to the uh, help page. We won't do that again. You've already seen that. And we've told you that you can save and resume this for later on. The guidelines themselves are divided into five parts. We will scan through them. The first part has to do with governance and planning. If you check all 12 of the minimum requirements, this box is already filled in here with a green X. If you did not check it, you wouldn't be on this page anyway. If you have a strategic plan, you can check this. And with a strategic plan, you can either give us the URL if your strategic plan is on your website, and we recommend that that would be a smart thing to do and a sharp thing to do so that your community knows about your strategic plan. If it's not on your website, you can check this box that you will send it to me, Richard Miller, as an attachment in an email so that we have a copy or can get a copy of your strategic plan. Now, you noticed when I checked that box, if you noticed before this was at 72 points, it went to 82 points. On this next box, if you already have a strategic plan, not if you're writing one this year for your first one, but if you already have a strategic plan and you have reviewed it in the past, you would check this box and you notice the point totals will go up to 87. And you have to indicate which of the library goals, and just type XYZ or something in there, which of the library goals addresses the fact that you look at the strategic plan every year. 
you would indicate the section of the strategic plan or the language from your strategic plan that indicates that. If you did review and revise it, you would put in there the month and the year, and that would be O something or something something dash and the two year digits for, in this case, you interviewed it or you reviewed it in January 13th or 2013. So indicate that as well. Um, 1.03 is one of those sections where I mentioned to you that you might be able to uh, get some extra points. This is an area that you might be able to. Uh, if you have something in your strategic plan, which you may, you might say in there that you review your board policies on an annual basis or at each June uh, annual meeting of the board or whatever you want to put in there that would indicate and connect with your library goals. Now here is where we have, I think it's 10. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, no, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16 we have. Oh, of course they're numbered. Okay. There are 16 goal, or excuse me, policies listed here that you might have uh, policies for already. If you have an advocacy policy, you can click that. If you don't know what advocacy means, you can go over to the help page and figure out what it is. If you have a collection development policy, which I'm sure all of you do, you'd click that. And each time you click these, the point total goes up by one. Now let's suppose that you don't have any others, but you have a weeding policy here, but you have other policies that are not listed here above. You can list those here and put a check mark. So you could get as many as 19 points on this one. That really offsets some of the other points that you might not be able to earn on some of the other things, such as local income or something else. All right, let's go through the rest of these. If you have a technology plan, you can check that. If you do that, you have to say which of the library goals. And then the next one, if you actually have reviewed your technology plan, then you can check that, but you have to state, uh, state which, part of, which goal addresses it if you've addressed it, and you have to say when you've reviewed this plan. This group, or this library here, McCook Public, does not have a library friends group, so that's a red X, and that's right out of the stats. It does have a library foundation, so there's a green X. That's right out of the statistics that you sent in. The next part of the guidelines deals with resources. This is the largest portion of the guidelines themselves, meaning there are more guidelines in here than any place else. And we'll go through this as quickly as we can. You check the box that is appropriate. In this case, the local income of McCook Public Library meets or exceeds, in this case it meets, the peer median. So that's a green check mark. If there's anything in your library goals about local income, you should cite it there. Under facilities, uh, you report the number of annual open hours that you have. Take the number of hours you're open per week and take it times 52, and that's what you send in to us. In this case, the peer median is 2,600 a year. The peer average is 2,614 per year. The Cook Public Library exceeds that by quite a bit. And again, if there's a library goal, that is related to that, put it there. Most of these you answer yourself. And this, of course, is self-reporting. I'm just going to click a couple of these so you see how it adds the five points on there, the three points on there, and so forth. And this probably is a good one to look at the health pa help page because it talks about federal, state, and local codes for safety and access, like the Americans, uh, uh, the, the disabled, the ADA for Disabilities Act, and so forth. Under staff, we're still under resources, remember, or we're still under resources. Under staff, uh, in this case, uh, there is a, a guideline for how much money you spend on staff. And in this case, uh, the Cook Public Library spends less than the median or the peer average figure, so that's a red X, and that came from your statistics. In, in terms of 2.0302, there is a professional level that is required of the library director. You want to talk about it now? I can. Let's have Laura talk about the certification of library director and certification level. Any librarian can join the Nebraska um, Librarian Certification Program. Uh, people are certified at various levels, and those levels reflect their um, higher education. So level one is a high school diploma. Level two is um, about two years of college or an associate's degree. Level three would be having a, a bachelor's degree. Level four would mean having a master's degree. 
and level five is having a master's degree in library science. Then these levels are further qualified. Sometimes we put an L on the end, and that means that they've had some training in library science. Um, either they've gone through the associates, the professional certificate or associates program at the community college, or they've done a bachelor's degree uh, program at, I think it's Shadron or UNO, you can get a bachelor's degree in. So uh, there, we require that a uh, library director for a library uh, up to um, 2,499 people that serves that many people would have at least a high school education. Further, um, everyone within the certification program needs to participate in 45 contact hours of continuing education each year. And the first, uh, the certification periods are three years long. And the first certification period, if a person does not have that formal education in library science, they need to fulfill the basic skills requirements, which they can do by taking the basic skills courses that are offered by the commission. Um, so each, each three-year certification period, I think I might have said that wrong before, each three-year certification period, a person needs to participate in 45 contact hours of continuing education, which earns them 45 CE credit. We keep track of it here at the Commission. Um, when you participate in a, a continuing education event, there's a form that you can fill out online and just hit the submit button, send it in to us. We'll record it for you. You can look at your record anytime online so you can see where you are. We actually do send emails reminding people. Some people would say nagging, but really we're just reminding you. Um, of how you're doing during your three-year certification period, we really recommend that people not leave it to the last minute. If you keep up with it as you go, you really only have to do about an hour and a quarter each month. Um, if you did one one-hour webinar each month and went to one um, workshop that lasted for an afternoon each year, you would have earned enough CE credits at the end of three years. So that's my little commercial. Talk about the next one also. Okay. Um, we also ask that the number of staff members participating in the uh, certification program uh, increase as the uh, number of people you serve increases. So for libraries that serve up to 2,499 people, you need only one staff member, and that has to be the director at that point has to be certified. If you serve more than that, up to about 5,000 people, you need at least two staff members who are in the certification program and in good standing, that they are certified. Um, up to 10,000 people, three staff members need to be certified, and over 10,000, four staff members need to be certified. So we would really like to see you participating in continuing education events. Um, which is really a, a substitute for saying we want you to keep up with all the changes that are going on in our, in our library world and to keep growing in your profession. So that's the deal with certification. If you have any questions, you can always call me. Thank you, Laura. You'll notice here that uh, this 2.0302 and 2.0303 look a little different from most of the other guidelines. These actually were pulled over from the old guidelines because there was no way that this group thought that we could, well, they felt it was important to have these in there, but we didn't want to do a comparison with peer libraries. This really just had to be this way it is. The other thing I want to add is that Laura mentioned that UNO and uh, Shadron State have undergraduate programs. UNK also has undergraduate programs. Okay. But you know that as well. Okay, so back on resources. We took that little side trip because it was important for you to know that. 2.0304 has to do with the number of library personnel. In this case, McCook Public Library exceeds or meets the, the average of the median for those. Uh, 2.0305 has to do with financial <coughs> resources committed by and expended by the library. And this, again, comes right out of the statistics that you send in. 
All right, technology, still under resources. Do you have an ILS? If you do, you check that. You get five points. This actually is already automatically checked because you report this to us in the statistics. Also, if your library catalog is on the Internet 24-7, that's already reported and will be reflected in here as well. The other ones have to do with broadband, uh, telephone service, technology accommodations for disabled folks, adequate number of libraries, and that really is, and here's where, here's where an adequate number of computers really is defined by you in your strategic planning, because we're not telling you what an adequate number of computers is, but that really should be reflected in your strategic plan. The next section of resources has to do with the collection. I'm going to take a little bit more time with this section because <clears throat> this section in particular <clears throat> I think will show you how these guidelines, in addition to, of course, having to be sent in for accreditation, can be used for planning purposes. In this particular case, you see that we've got 2.05.02.04.05.06.07 in here, and all of these have to do with your library collection. And you really would interpret these yourself as to what they're telling you. In this case, they meet the 3% average weeding over three years. That's fine. In the case of the annual expenditure on materials, 2.0504, which I think I mentioned before, in this case, McCook exceeds that. In the case of the annual circulation, the next one, McCook does not meet or exceed, although they're close to meeting, uh, meeting the median figure. The turnover rate, which has to do with basically an average of how many times a book circulates, one book from your collection circulates, uh, and then the last one, the collection size per capita. Uh, all of those you can look at and say, all right, well, if our annual expenditure mater for materials is okay, we meet that, that's fine, but if our annual circulation is below that of our peers, what does that say? Well, it might say to you that uh, you don't have some books on the shelves that you need to have on the shelves so that you get more circulation. It might say to you that you need a bigger collection because you'll notice down at 2.0507, that library collection size per capita is quite a bit lower than that of the peers. Maybe they need a larger collection. Uh, however, they're doing okay on the turnover rate on 2.0506, which means the stuff they have is going out. So you can't, we can't tell you what that means, but by comparing yourself with your peers, you might be able to draw some conclusions and then use that information when you're dealing with your funders to say, you know what, we really need to increase our collection size. Or maybe we're not weeding enough. Maybe we need to get rid of some of the books that are not circulating so that the, the newer books and the popular books can be found in the collection. That, those are ways that you can use these guidelines for planning purposes in addition to just applying for accreditation. Part three has to do with services. <clears throat> this talks about um, <coughs> 301 talks about, 3.01 talks about outreach services. Um, 3.02 talks about extension services. And here again, 3.03, 05, and 06 are reported uh, by you in your, in your statistics that you send in. In this case, the Cook Public Library's attendance per capita at programs exceeds or meets uh, those of its peers. In this case, uh, it has access to, or it, makes available access to the databases, and you reported that, that we make available. And it does have wireless access or Wi-Fi in the library itself, and that again is reported. Also mentioned in this area is access to databases that go beyond those that the uh, commission uh, makes available to public libraries. And uh, library programs and services, which you say you've uh, segmented to apply to particular par portions of your uh, population. And again, uh, put in there if you've got library goals that address those. Part four has to do with cooperation and collaboration. I think that these are all self-reported in this section. It says that your library director or a member of the board attends at least two village board mem uh, meetings or city council meetings or county commissioner township board meetings per year. Certainly be encouraged to attend more than that because you need to be visible with those folks. Staff participates in community organizations and groups to keep the library visible and engaged. Uh, the library has a teen advisory board. The library cooperates with local entities for shared services. The library board members participate in regional, statewide, or national advocacy efforts such as Advocacy Day or Legislative Day coming up on February 5th here in Lincoln. 
And if you have board members that participate, you get one point for each board member whose name you list there that did participate in an activity like that. And uh, the library is engaged in uh, some resource sharing consortia, such as Overdrive or Nebraska Card or Pioneer Consortium or whatever other sorts of consortia might be around. Uh, there are some definitions here which you will want to look at. In particular, 4.04 .04 seemed to confuse people last year, but we did actually take out a different guideline from a different section that confused people. I think you'll understand it this year, but take a look at the help page for that definition. And the last part has to do with communications. <clears throat> if you post your mission statement and your policies on the library website, you could get four points for that. If you provide uh, interactions on your website or you do blogging or you have a Facebook or Twitter account or some other thing, you could list that there and get 10 points. If you use non-internet public relations and marketing tools, you can uh, get uh, four points on that one. If you have regular updated exhibits and displays, if you offer a bulletin board, if you report regularly on the library to the village board, now this is in addition to that annual mandatory one that you have to do in February, this would be a good idea for you to go and report to them. You would hope verbally, but if not, get them a written statement. And the example I would give, and I don't think uh, uh, Lisa is on the uh, phone call here from uh, Crete today, but she's the one that she got this idea from somebody else. She actually did her annual report one year by getting those really large oversized Hershey's chocolate bars and having the report printed and handing it out to each member of the city council. They loved it. I mean, they loved the report, but they loved the chocolate too, of yeah. course. Um, you should post those reports that you do on your website so that you keep the, the public informed. And you should communicate regularly with those elected officials, business leaders. Laura said something to me the other day, and she said, she said that, you know, I think if we're going to say anything for a beginning public librarian, the first thing we should tell them is, get to know and get along with your city clerk. Absolutely right. essential. Absolutely essential. Take them coffee cake or something, you know. Um, in this case, we've uh, got up to 108 points. I didn't check many of these. Of course, when, uh, uh, when Jody, the library director at McCook, does this, she'll uh, change these things. And when I get out of here, uh, it's not going to save these things because I'm not going to save and resume. Uh, I'm going to try to submit the application and see if that red thing comes up. Is it grinding? Maybe it's not doing it. Well, the red thing is not going to come up for your viewing pleasure. All right. That's a pretty good review of the guidelines. Shall we go back here? No, we shall go here and go back. That's what we shall do. No, we want to go to our... Uh, and then go down slides. to the slides. The, yeah. Thank you. All right. Are you taking over at this point? Um, Minimize it. All the way right. Yep. There you go. Okay. Back where you okay, we're back to our slides now, and we're going to go to the niche side. And now we're going to talk about strategic planning. Why are we talking about strategic planning? Well, as you see, the accreditation guidelines are very much customized for your library because it's felt that your library, you are probably the expert on what your community needs for your library to be doing. But in order for us to accredit your library, because we want to know that, you know, you're there doing what you're doing, um, we need to kind of know what your strategic plan is. So we've asked for you to tell us about your goals in the accreditation guidelines and to send us a copy of a strategic plan with your accreditation um, application. So, about strategic planning. We knew, how will you complete your library's strategic plan? We knew that many libraries had a strategic plan. They had been planning for a long time. They, they had a cycle where every couple of years they put together a new strategic plan, and they reviewed their strategic plan every year. But we knew that some libraries did not, or they did a very informal kind of plan uh, and it wasn't really written down. Uh, but we're going to need something written. So 
what is a strategic plan? It needs seven elements to be a strategic plan. And if you have a plan that already has these seven elements, that's great. You've pretty much fulfilled the requirements we have. Um, and those seven elements are, first, a mission statement. As we've said, one of the requirements is that your library's mission, you can get some points in the accreditation guidelines if your mission statement is on your website. And when we go and look for examples of mission statements, they're there. Most libraries have a mission statement, which is simply one or two sentences that say what the library does. Then we want a community profile. Yes, I think many of you are very involved with your community and you know pretty much who lives in your community. But there are always pockets that maybe we don't know because these aren't the people we see every day. Um, it's good as librarians when we have information we always want to verify it. We always want to make sure that we have good sources of information. And so we're asking you to verify with some statistical information about your community. Um, and tell us about your community. Then we want an assessment of community needs. Have you actually talked to people and asked them what they think the community needs are? Um, then we want an analysis of the library's strengths and weaknesses and an analysis of the opportunities and threats from outside the library to the library. This is that old SWOT analysis kind of broken out to make it a little easier to get your head around. And it means that you've really given some real thought to what the library can do in the community. And then we want an analysis of what all this means and where the library can contribute to community progress. So you take those community needs, you take the strengths and weaknesses of the library, and you say, aha, the library is really good at this and the community really needs this so the library will have a goal to help the community with X, whatever it is. That's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, so we want specific goals and we want measurable objectives. And why measurable, measurable objectives or action plans? Well, to know how well you did. Um, to help you figure out where to do better next time to help you decide whether this was a really worthwhile program to continue or not. There's lots of reasons why you want your goals to be measurable. And you want a plan for evaluation, which is why the goals need to be measurable so you can evaluate. Um, those are the seven elements, and if your strategic plan has those, you're golden, you have a plan. Why, why do we want you to plan? Well, we want you to plan partly for these accreditation guidelines. But there's lots of reasons to plan. Uh, planning will actually do a lot for you. It can really be a tool in your library. So why plan? Let's go through some reasons real quick. To know what direction you're headed in. It's just, uh, you know, to kind of have an idea of, okay, this is what we're going we're to be doing to make informed decisions because the big piece of planning is gathering information to base decisions on. To allocate your resources effectively. No library. I don't think there's a library anywhere in the world that has as many resources as they could actually use. Um, and we could have some fabulous libraries if we could all just double our budgets. But we can't. So we have to decide where to put our resources, and planning helps you do that. Establishing priorities. In many ways, that's the same thing as um, allocating resources, since you allocate resources to the things you think are most important. But sometimes things that are important don't take a lot of money. Um, sometimes things that aren't as important, but they take more money. You know, you, but you have to establish priorities. You want to prepare for changes coming in the future. Um, and one of the things that helps you prepare for changes is to really understand what the environment is now. To help illustrate a need for more funding, you can go 
to your town council and say, oh, we need more money. And they can say, yeah, well, join the club. But if you say, we want to do this for the community and that will take this kind of funding, they're much more likely to say, oh, well, that's a really worthwhile program. We'll see if we can help find some of that money. It's also if you were going to apply for money from other sources, for instance, a grant. Grant makers don't just hand out money. They want to know how you're going to spend it. You have to have a plan in a grant. So this will actually help you with writing grants and getting money. Um, to gain insight from the perspectives of others. You know, we get kind of wrapped up in what we're doing sometimes, and getting an outside perspective is sometimes very illuminating. Uh, to discover new ways of thinking about old problems, opportunities, challenges, barriers, um, sometimes things that we don't even perceive as opportunities to other people are obvious. Sometimes things that we understand why a library does it some a particular way, someone outside doesn't, and we under and that helps us realize that we need to explain to people what we're doing. So that's a good reason to plan. To find alternatives. We talked about grants before. Um, you can't just sit back anymore. You know, we're gonna partnerships too. We have to get out there and see if we can't find partners, we can't find grant monies, we can't find um, ways to convince our governing bodies to help us out. To provide a more seamless transition, there's going to be staff changes. People change. Baby boomers are going to start retiring right and left. So if you have a plan, this leaves the people who come after you with an idea of what was going on. Um, you know, probably most of us wouldn't get hit by a bus tomorrow, but if we did, would people know where things were? Um, what what kind of, of programs we had coming up? A plan helps them with that. To make your responses to change more agile, there's a wonderful quotation from, actually, Dwight Eisenhower, and he was talking, of course, about planning um, a war in Europe, but he was talking about how the most important thing about planning was the planning process and not the plan itself, because, of course, as soon as you go into battle, a plan gets blown. But if you've done the planning process, you now have enough background to make your changes to new uh, situations. So it's a good reason to plan. Finally, the big deal is planning helps you make choices because you can't do it all. We know there is so much going on. There's new technologies coming down the pike. There's new services coming down the pike. I mean, now we have um, uh, FreeGal. And we have, what is it, Zinio? Zinio. Zinio. And, uh, I mean, there's this new stuff all the time, and we can't do it all. So what are the things that really will serve the community? What does the community really need? And a strategic plan helps you do that. It also helps you get a handle on things and figure out, okay, this is how we're going to handle a particular situation. So there's really a lot of really good reasons to plan. One of the big reasons, actually, that we haven't talked about is how you get buy-in. Um, we happened to be doing this workshop in Columbus yesterday, and Jill Owens, the director there, and they've gone through a very extensive planning process there. Uh, Jill was saying one of the big things that she felt she'd gained through the planning process was a lot of community buy-in and community interest in what the library was doing. So it's a great reason to plan. OK, if you're starting from scratch, because we know that some of you don't have plans, or if you want to start over because you've seen the planning process and you think, wow, we really need to get more into this, we wanted to make planning possible for people. Um, there are a lot of different books and plans out there that you can use. Um, and we'll show you a few of them later 
here on these slides. But we wanted to come up with something that we thought would be fairly quick, but would hit the important parts of planning. So we've come up with a fairly simple way to plan. Um, we have a set of worksheets, and they're on that page about on our website about uh, accreditation and planning, and we'll go to that live in a minute. But the worksheets are presented in a, in a uh, table, and there's six worksheets, basically, plan to plan, the community profile, the community needs, take stock, you develop your goals, and then you how you're going to evaluate. And then when you filled out all six of those worksheets, you put the results from that, you summarize the results from that on the strategic plan summary. And that's what you send in. So you just have to fill out the worksheets, summarize them on the strategic plan summary, and you'll have a plan. Now, we have also, because the worksheets are listed here, then we actually made a video that kind of explains the deal about the worksheets. Um, all six regional system administrators and I went together and made a video. Uh, it's actually one long video, but we have um, inter intervening links so that you can take just the section you want to look at right then. And then there's some how-to guides that are a little bit more extensive about how you would do some of the things that the worksheets are asking you to do. So we can, again, go to that because at the Public Library Accreditation um, page, is this the, oops, that's the login, and I do need to go. This is the page. See, I'll show you. And we just want to scroll down. This is a kind of a long page, actually, but see, it's right here on the page. There are links to all these worksheets. Now, we actually made a decision that each worksheet would be just a plain Word document. So the deal is to open the worksheet. Let's see, I'm opening it. <laughs> and then save it to your computer. And then you can use it, you can move things around. You know, it doesn't have to, you don't have to fit into the box, for heaven's sake. You can make those boxes bigger if you want. Um, the first worksheet is plan to plan because, well, a project really isn't a project until you have deadlines and you have somebody assigned to do it. That's just, you know. And it's easy to get things put off. It's easy to get things, well, hey, I don't want to do it. You do it. You know. So you need to assign people, and you need to kind of decide, these are the steps we're going to take, and this is when we're going to get them done. Um, and right now you have, well, let me see, February, March, April, May, June, July. Probably you want to be about done with this in July or August. So that's like six, seven months to go. That's enough time, but you need to get started. Um, then we want to go back. This is going to be very tricky here because I'm going to keep going back and forth. Yep. What do you want to go to PowerPoint? One over this way. There you go. Oh, no, I didn't want to go to the PowerPoint. I wanted to go to the page live. Oh, well, it's still on the bell, too. There, yeah. Okay, That's see, okay. we're back to the live page again. That was worksheet number one, where you plan to plan. And we have stuff on the how-to guides about why plan, and a little bit about the planning team. Um, this is a how-to guide. You don't have to fill this out. This is just for your um, information. But we really recommend that a planning team be about 5 to 12 people, that you have at least a, um, a representative of the staff, a representative of the board, if not the whole board, and some community stakeholders. Why do you want to mix it up like this and not have it just be the board or, you know, just the director sitting in her office? Well, because you need viewpoints from more than one person and you need more people to do the work. Um, so we really recommend this as far as having a group. And that group really needs to be a team, and that team 
you might want to really think about consensus and the idea that when you do something, you want a, what they call a mutually acceptable resolution, which means that not everybody agrees with something, but everybody can live with it. It means that everybody on the team has to speak up. They don't have to be mean, but they do have to say what they really think. And they have to be willing to say, okay, well, I don't love that, but I can live with it. And that's kind of how you reach consensus. It would be nice if we could teach that to our Congress. And, well, it would. Anyway, this is about the planning team. And that's important enough to give a little thought to because it's going to make a real difference in your planning if you have people that can work together. And really, the thing that makes people work together most is to agree on a goal. And if their goal is to come up with a plan by a certain time, you'll get people really working together. Okay. Back to worksheet number two, the community profile. This, I think, is worth the most formidable worksheet to fill out, although it's not really that hard when you come right down to it. Um, what we're asking you for is some demographic information. And you can get demographic information from the census, from the American Fact Finder. So we're going to get very tricky and use the link there to go to the American Fact Finder. This is the interface that the U.S. Census Bureau has spent mucho bucks on <laughs> to try to get a good interface so that people can use their information because their information is extensive. Um, so you just put in the name of your town if we're using McCook today. See, it doesn't leave it to chance. You just put in McCook and it'll give you a list of all the McCooks and you get to pick one. We pick McCook City, Nebraska and go. And it lists then, here's McCook. They say it, they have 7,698 people. This is according to the 2010 census. Now, a complete census is done every 10 years. Um, it's mandated by the Constitution. It's been done every 10 years since 1790. But then in between, they do what they call the American Community Survey, which is a sampling. Now, statistically, th that sampling is really quite accurate. Although when you get to very, very small groups of people, it becomes a little less solid. Um, it's still very usable information, but it lists the tables here. There's many more tables, but these are the popular ones. And the first one is the general population. And if we look at this, we can see that here's all the people in McCook listed by uh, groups of five in their age groups and telling what the percent of people in the town are in those age groups. Now, you know what the biggest, um, the fastest growing group of people in the U.S. is? It's people 85 years and older. Very old people. Um, that group is getting bigger and bigger. The boomers haven't quite got there yet, so there's going to be an explosion soon. Um, they're working on but, it. Um, it, why does this matter? Why would it matter how old the people in your town are? Well, the reading interests of people under five are really quite different than the reading <laughs> interests of people in mature years. Um, and this means a lot in terms of your collection. It means a lot in terms of your programming. It may mean a great deal in terms of your services. Um, for instance, if you have a, if this group is really big and getting bigger, that may mean outreach to people. It may be home delivery to things that where people are homebound anymore. It may mean that you really need to make sure that any assisted living or nursing home in your town uh, has some services, that you need to be sure that you can recommend the talking book service to people who would enjoy reading but are having difficulty with it. Um, your small population under five years, uh, this means that you may want to be, but if this is growing or you really have a lot of people in this cohort, you may want to do a lot more story times. Um, you have a lot of teens, well, that 
how is how's your teen advisory board doing? How is your teen um, area in your library? Um, you have people in this 20 to 24 year bracket, but you're not seeing them come in the library. Well, maybe that means some programming for young adults. So we know that reading interests are really different for people in different age groups, generally. And so we want to know how old are people. Okay, we also kind of need to know, probably not race so much as there's a uh, thing in one of these tables. Yeah. Yeah. So we go back to a different, and here's your demographic and housing estimates. Here's your demographic characteristics. Then we can talk about, say, if we ask for education, educational attainment, because we know that, for instance, um, people with higher educational attainment tend to read more. Um, so we ask for that kind of information. And that's just, so look, I find these fa tables fascinating. I could spend a lot of time with this. I think there's really a lot of information to be mined out of this and out of this. But take a look, and that's why we put together the worksheet. We ask you to fill out these things. Now, this doesn't mean that these are the only things you have to fill out. If you have more information about your community, if you want some more information, you can certainly include that in your, popul in your community profile. And we'd love to see you put together a really rich community profile. One of the things that you find when you look online, and you just you know Google community profiles, and you'll find them all over the place. But it's very interesting, the ones that are put together by the Parks and Rec Department are very different than the ones that are put together by the Department of Transportation, where they're interested in commuting patterns. And they're very different than the ones put together by the economic development people. So if you took all of these and put them together and had one big community profile, you would have a very rich picture of your community. And maybe this is something that your library would want to consider doing, is being kind of a keeper of community information. One of the things I like to suggest to people is that you get a file folder, a plain old low-tech file folder. And you put it in your desk, and every time you see something about your community, clip it out or make a copy of it and put it in your file folder. If a church bulletin says how many members there are in the congregation, save that. If an article in the paper says how many kids played Little League football or baseball, I guess there isn't really Little League football, is there? Little League baseball, put that in your file folder. Um, yes, try to get the sources of the information along with the information so that when you go back to it later and you might want to update it, or get further information, you'll be able to do that. But if you keep gathering information just when you see it, you'll have a lot of good stuff there that you can put in your profile that really tells you a lot about your community and what your community needs. Mark, can you talk about that in the gray area? Just oh, OK. About how that's their responsibility sure. to figure out as opposed to from an actual fact finder. Or Okay, now, when we ask you to describe the library in your schools, um, this is something that you're going to have to do. You can't just look this up in the American Fact Finder. You kind of need to take a look at your library in your school and say, oh, yes, it's a really good school library, or it's a school library that's using accelerated reading, um, or it's a library that uh, is used a lot for study halls so the kids may not really be... Um, looking at the books as much as they might. It, you don't know. So I would really recommend, and it's good to have a, a good working relationship with the school librarian. Um, so you're going to have to kind of look at that. The higher education institutions, well, anymore with extension services, it's pretty much everybody in America, isn't it? But if you have a number of people in your community taking community college courses, um, and doing it online, 
they may need some library assistance and you have to figure out, well, do you need to serve these people and how can you best serve these people? So kind of look at that. Um, then we ask about language spoken at home. Now we could ask about ethnic background, but really isn't language spoken at home for us a better indicator of the kinds of needs people are going to have? If they speak <coughs> excuse me, if they speak Spanish at home, then maybe you're going to need some Spanish language materials. Or you're going to need materials about English as a second language for those people who are trying to learn English. Then work life. Why would we ask about families where both parents of children under six years old are in the labor force? Well, because those kids are in daycare. So does that affect when story times are? It just might. Um, it, it may really mean that you need to do things in the evening or that you need to take story times out to the daycare providers. It's a real indication of how to provide services. Then how much poverty and um, how much unemployment you have, that again helps you determine do you really need to get into e-government and be able to help people fill out their unemployment uh, insurance applications online? If they're below the poverty line, do you need to help them fill out some other kinds of online forms? So they're real indicators. These figures, yes, they're just numbers, but they are indicators of how, where people are in their lives and then how you can help them. There's more farther down the way this got split up. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Next page. Okay, and your economic characteristics. If you know who the big employers are in town, sometimes that's important. If you have a lot of engineers in your town, you might need slightly different materials than if you have a lot of salesmen. You have engineers and salesmen, well, the world's their oyster. Um, and some of the cultural characteristics of the community. Um, what are the recreational facilities available? Um, what kind of clubs do you have? Um, it, and this helps because you can develop partnerships. Um, what are your community's means for public communication? Um, do you usually, would putting um, an article in the newspaper reach everyone in town? Uh, do you have a radio station? Is your Facebook page really active or do you have a Facebook page? And would that be worthwhile in your community? Will a lot of people see your Facebook page? These are the kinds of things that you really want to think about and gather this information so that you kind of know which way you want to go. Again, this idea of planning helps you figure out which way to head. Okay, so we go back to our page. That was worksheet number two. And that may be one of the more complicated worksheets, but really worthwhile in terms of putting together a lot of information. Then worksheet three is, is about assessing the community needs. This means going out and asking people. And there are several ways to do it. Um, and we ask you just to let us know how you did it and when. What methods you used. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But this is a worksheet to kind of record what you were doing. Make notes as you go so that you don't forget. Um, the how-to guide for this, I think, is pretty good in terms of, there's two of them, how to assess community needs, and then this running a focus group. And I'm going to click on this for just a second, because focus groups are one of the ways that you really may use. And there's some pretty good directions here um, on how to do this if you've never done it. Because there is a way to do it that will make it more successful for you. And there are some references if you want to go further. We have some, um, these were very good, I thought, um, on the internet to explain how to do this.
Okay, the assessed community needs. Okay. There are a number of different methods. Um, the one I think everybody thinks about is surveys. And yes, SurveyMonkey has made that very easy, but if that's a computerized survey, you're only going to reach certain segments of your population. There are going to be some people that you are not going to reach with a survey. Surveys are also a little bit tricky in that you have to be really careful about how you write the questions. Um, it's sort of a rule of thumb that if it is possible in any way to misinterpret a question, they will. So you have to test your questions. Make sure that, you know, talk to your best friends and ask them what they think of your questions if you're going to do a survey. A survey is a good way to reach a lot of people. For instance, we had one person in one of our workshops say that she could include her surveys in the um, utility bills for her community if she stuffed all the envelopes. Um, well, you know, it, it takes your time, but it didn't actually take cash. And she got a really good return rate. So if that's something that's possible, good. But surveys are tricky. And they, if, if you use any one of these methods, actually, you probably need to use another method, too. You don't rely on just one method. Um, but there's surveys. And there's some links here to other things on how to do surveys, um, that this conducting needs assessment surveys is really very good. Focus groups are another good way. We have a whole thing on how to do focus groups. Um, this is something that I think is really possible for you. So I would kind of encourage you maybe to try this. You get a small number of people, 6 to 12 people, get together, and it's kind of interview, it's kind of a group interview. The trick for a moderator is to get everybody to talk, to not let any one person really dominate the conversation, and to select people that have some differences but probably don't have conflicts, so that you get a conversation and not a fight. Um, also that people, for instance, if you had teenagers and community leaders in the same focus group, the community leaders might really intimidate the teens. Whereas if you get a bunch of teens together, they'll really talk. Um, so you kind of have to think a lot about how you're going to um, choose the members of your focus group, but it's a good way uh, to talk to people. Um, if there are community meetings, any community meeting, the Kiwanis Club, the Chamber of Commerce, the Optimists, the uh, Church Altar Guild, the Garden Club, any club, and very often these clubs are really looking for somebody to do a program. So you can come and do a program and ask people uh, what they think the community needs are. And we really want to emphasize that when you're doing this, you want to ask about community needs, not what people think of the library. Uh, for one thing, many, many people, most people are so nice, and they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. And that is really what you want here. You want to know, what does the community really need? So if you're asking people um, about, you know, if we had big community projects in the next five years, what do you think are the most important ones we should do first? Um, what things would you really like to do um, what kinds of activities would you like to participate in um, that you've never tried before? Um, what What do you think your kids like to do? Where would they like to hang out? What kind of hangout would they like to have? Really think of a bunch of questions to ask people and uh, try to get a conversation going in these meetings about um, these things so that you get an, a idea of what the community members really think are needed. Um, it's a good trick, if you can, to record this stuff, to record the conversation. If you can't record the conversation, it's also good to take someone with you to take notes so that you really have a pretty good record of what went on. Then you can use nominal groups 
or you can use key informant interviews, and this is essentially with key informant interviews, um, talking to people who you think are pretty savvy, who know what's going on in the community. So, for instance, if you have a church, you probably wouldn't want to talk to the minister. You would want to talk to one of the people, one of the leaders of the congregation. Um, you want to talk to a couple of business people who seem to be very involved with community affairs. You want to talk to a couple of people who are just people who have jobs in the community, but they're but they have a large group of people that they um, interact with, so that you kind of get a representative view. And you can't do just one key informant interview. You need to do half a dozen at least, and we'd love to see you do a dozen. But these are ways to find out what the community needs. And what do you do with that? Once you've found all that out, well, you just put it on the worksheet. Oh, this is how to put the community needs. And again, you'd let us know, you know, who you, who you interviewed, when you had a focus group, what kind of survey you did. Oh, an observation is another thing. Now, you probably are pretty observant and you have seen things in your community, so you know about what some of the needs are. But do you always go to the same grocery store? Maybe you need to try a different store um, and get a different viewpoint. Maybe you need to actually drive up and down some streets. Look at the houses. Are they well kept or do they need paint? Um, are there a lot of people um, sitting in, uh, you know, sitting around, or does everybody seem to be busy and, and doing something? Are they all engaged in work during the day? Um, so you can actually find out a lot about your community just by observing. But try to make your observation a little bit more systematic and a little bit more, what would we say, objective than you perhaps would in your daily life. Yeah, that's a good thing. Pretend you just arrived in town. Oh, real estate people. Talk to real estate people. They usually have a pretty good um, uh, viewpoint of what's going on. Then we ask you to take stock. After you've looked at the community, you've kind of thought about what the community needs are, look at the library. What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Now, this is the old SWOT analysis that a lot of you might be familiar with. Um, but we've kind of broken it down to make it a little easier to organize your thoughts. Um, so, for instance, your strengths and weaknesses, your human resources. Uh, your strengths are that you have a great staff that have been there a long time. They really understand how the flow of work goes in the library. They're really good at cu customer service, but they don't speak Spanish, and that's a weakness because you could really use some Spanish sometimes. Um, your facilities. You have a great building. Your carpeting is pretty new. Um, you don't have any shelves that are more than six feet tall. Uh, you have a nice meeting room, uh, but your air conditioner is on the fritz. Uh, and that's a weakness. So see what I mean? Um, and you don't always have to have the same number of strengths or weaknesses, but try to really take an objective view of your library and say, okay, this is our technology. You know, we have these new computers and we got all this great equipment, um, but we need to learn a little bit more about using the e-government resources to help people. Um, we have a really good collection, but we have um, a group of older gentlemen who have really indicated an interest in um, Westerns and true adventure, and we need to beef that up in our collection. You know, really take a look at it. Uh, what do you need? What's good? What's, what's not so good? And then your external environment. So you've looked at the library itself. Then look at the things that are really going to affect the library from outside. Your opportunities and your threats, the economy, the opportunities. Um, they're building a new plant. And that's going to be great. 
Um, there's going to be new, uh, new people coming to town. The threats, well, um, the, there's some infrastructure on Main Street that really needs fixing. Um, the technology, yeah, you've gotten this great broadband, but the threats, well, the phone company isn't doing so well. You know, you, there's opportunities and threats, and these are things from outside the library that are going to affect the library because the environment we work in really affects us. Okay, now you've taken your community profile, you've taken the community needs, you've taken stock of the library. Let's talk just for a second about mission. Well, let's not. We'll talk about that in a minute, okay? But mission statement comes in at this point. You develop goals and objectives. See, you write down, okay, these, I've, take, I've looked at all the community needs, and now I'm going to say, and listed them, and kind of ranked them and said, okay, these are the community needs and the ones that the library really can help deal with. And sometimes these are surprising. Um, for instance, um, we're really having a problem with um, the town dump. Too much stuff is getting put in the dump, and we really need to emphasize recycling. Well, what can the library do about that? Because you're not going to go out and collect garbage. That's not your thing. But you could put together a whole list of information about recycling. You could show people um, where there are recycling facilities. You, you could have a list for people. Um, you, you could have a program on what are some of the things that people can do with recycled materials and how builders and people who are remodeling their houses can really look at recycled materials and how to recycle the materials they're getting rid of. So that's a goal, you a community need that you could actually address if you decide that's important. But take your community needs. We have three listed here. I probably wouldn't say, oh, no more than five. You know, from three to five is a good number. Then your goal, you write a goal, and then objectives, and we'll talk about writing goals and objectives in a little while, um, for each one of these community needs. We go back. That was worksheet five. And this is, we have some helps here about setting priorities. We talk about that. how you would set priorities, how you identify your options, and then you choose the ones that you think are the most important or the ones that you can really help with. And then we kind of talk about project management and executing the plan a little, and you can read that if you want. Then worksheet six is how you're going to evaluate. Once you've put together your goals and objectives, how are you going to measure whether you were successful or not. And it's not just the matter of whether you were, su were successful. It's a matter of did one thing work better than another to achieve the goal? Um, was this something that would be worthwhile to repeat? Um, was this something that took a whole lot more time and money than you thought it was going to and maybe you just can't do it again? So you really want to be able to evaluate how you've done so that you set up your cycle of planning for the next time. Then we get to the strategic plan summary. And you kind of summarize on this what you did in all these other worksheets. And this again is a Word document, so you would open this up save it to your computer, and use as much room as you'd like to. We have some samples here that Richard will talk about in a little while. And we have one that's, oh goodness, it's 22 pages long. Um, and that's probably kind of long for many of these things. We have another one that's about five pages long. Maybe that's a little on the short side. Um, 
But don't didn't you hate it when you had assignments in school and you asked them how long does it have to be and they said long enough to cover the subject? But that's the deal here. This kind of needs to be long enough to cover the subject. And you will have some of these worksheets, for instance, with your demographic information, that will be several pages that you aren't turning in. We don't need to see the worksheets. We just need to need the summary of what you found on each worksheet. So that, in a nutshell, is the planning process. This isn't as fancy as many planning processes, but we think this will get you to having a workable plan, something that really will, you can use in your community. And that's all we were trying to do. So now we're still live on our page, on our website. Let's go back to our slides back here, PowerPoint. And you see this, and we'll go to the next page. We want to talk a little bit about other sources of community information. Remember we talked about uh, looking at the American Fact Finder. But your city or county planning department may have already done some community surveys and some, and some community and needs assessments. They may have done a community profile. So make sure you check with them because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, your observation is worthwhile. So include that. The schools may have some information. So really check around with people and if they have information, you can include their information in your worksheet or in your planning process. We do have a list um, on the Nebraska Library Commission's website in the Nebraska Access section um, where we have a list of uh, recommended websites the page is called Where Can I Find Statistics About Nebraska Counties and Towns? And here is the, um, see, here's the page. They have a lot of different places that you can go to find statistics. They were selected by librarians. Yes, they were selected by librarians. So you know they're good. You, you betcha. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. Now, how do you find out about the community needs and wants? We kind of went through this, but I wanted to emphasize there are several ways. You probably want to choose more than one way. And we really, it kind of comes down to there are focus groups, which is a group interview, key informant interviews, which is interviews with people who kind of know what's going on in their, um, in their area. Um, the community forums where you talk to people who are already meeting, who, you know, groups and clubs, that kind of thing. Observation where you walk around town and look and see. And surveys where you send out a list of questions and ask people to answer them. And the whole deal with community needs and wants is that you're going to see a lot of them. And that's okay. But you're going to choose the ones that the library really is uniquely qualified to address. And you do need to be a little bit imaginative about how you address needs. And you may not be able to solve a whole problem, but you may be able to make a real contribution to the solving of the problem. So really think about that when you look at the community needs and you decide which ones that you need to address in your library. Oh, whoops, sorry. Okay, we've also talked about putting together goals and objectives. And I want to talk a little bit about objectives. They say that objectives should be SMART. Well, okay, somebody put together an acronym. But nevertheless, it's a, a good thing, it's a good way to remember that you want your objectives to be pretty specific. You want them to be measurable so that you can tell, okay, how did we do? You want them to be attainable. In other words, we have to deal in, you have to be able to do it. They do not have to be easy. Um, I would think that probably you want a 
um, combination, some easy, some not so easy, maybe even one or two hard. But that's okay because you don't stretch yourself and you don't really achieve if you don't set out to achieve. So make them attainable, but they don't all have to be, you know, dead easy. Realistic, um, you know, Chances are, no matter how many lottery tickets you buy, you're just not going to win. Uh, you know, we, we do have to deal with the real world. And timely. Um, you do want them to be able to be um, accomplished within the time you have. And you do want a deadline date on things. Because as we've said, something is not a project until someone is assigned to do it and they have a deadline. We've talked about goals and objectives. Goals are broad statements of kind of something you want to achieve. Objectives are how you're going to achieve it. So objectives are narrow and precise. For instance, if you have a goal, this is one of the community needs that you have unemployed community members. So your goal is to assist the unemployed community members and you're going to do this by helping them to improve their job seeking skills and by publicizing job opportunities for them. That's a goal. Then your objectives would be, okay, we're going to do these specific things. We're going to continue to compile and update a weekly list of job opportunity sources. So this has a deadline every week. It's also okay if one of your objectives is conti to continue to do something that you haven't done before or that you have done before. Uh, we'd like to see you do some new things too, but you can continue to do old things if they were good things. Then another objective would be to offer programs on upgrading skills at least once a month. So there's another time every month you need to offer a program on upgrading skills. And we're kind of specific about the kinds of skills we're talking about. Then another objective is to have a partnership with your Chamber of Commerce and hold a job training fair. And this job training fair is going to have at least 12 prospective employers or people who offer job training. And you're going to do it in February, so that's a date. And you're going to do it for upcoming graduates, your people from your high school, and your unemployed people. So that's really very specific, and it's going to be a big job. But the, those are objectives. Those are things that you're going to be able to measure, that you're going to be able to say, yes, we did it by the, by the deadline date. And you're going to be able to say, and this is, you know, how, how many jobs off we, how many jobs we listed, how many places we checked with to find the jobs uh, that we listed, um, the programs, how many people, um, how many people attended the programs, how many people rated the programs as useful, um, how many people you followed up with who uh, then were able to write a good resume, that kind of thing are your objectives. Now remember we talked a little bit about mission statement and we said the mission statement kind of fits in when you're taking stock of your library. Um, but it also kind of fits in at the beginning because you want to know what it is that your what your job really is, what you really are doing, and it kind of fits in at the end. So in other words, you need a mission statement all along. And a mission statement really, one or two sentences that say what your library does. And this is almost more a internal document than an external document, although we would expect you to put it on your web page. Because you want to keep in mind, because it is true, when you are up to your neck in alligators, it's hard to remember that the objective was to drain the swamp. So you really want the mission statement so you can always keep in mind that this is what you do. 
And these are the things that a good mission statement is. I have a couple of examples for you here. This is the New York Public Library. I think this is really good. Of course, they've probably got the best advertising copywriters in the world to write it for them. But, or maybe they didn't. I don't know. They may have had a staff contest to write them. I, I really, I don't know. I, but isn't this what a public library does to inspire lifelong learning, advance knowledge, strengthen the community? I think that's great. Here's one from Oakland Public Library here in Nebraska to provide quality materials and services, fulfill the educational, informational, cultural, and recreational needs. And they want to say in an atmosphere that's welcoming, respectful, and professional. Wow, I think that's pretty cool. Again, that's one sentence. And that's all you need. Um, take a look. Google it. If you Google Nebraska Public Library Mission Statement, you will find a whole bunch of examples. Take a look at them. If there are terms you like, the way they say things that you like, borrow them. No one will mind. And you can come up with your own mission statement that you think really describes what your library does. And keep that in mind because sometimes you just need to remind yourself. Okay, and now evaluation. Why do we evaluate? What are we doing here? You know, you think, why evaluate the program? It's over. Well, you might want to do it again. And it's also amazing when you're in the middle of a project, you, it kind of sparks off new ideas. So you get ideas for the next planning cycle. You see how you did, just because you want to know how you did. You develop priorities. Um, if one thing works better than another, maybe you'll do more of that and less of the other. And you find improvements for next time so that you keep growing. And that's why we want you to evaluate. So, have we got planning down now? Strategic planning does come in various shapes and sizes. They all do have some basic steps, which we have tried to include in those worksheets, but there are other things you could use if you want to. Um, the CLIP plan, which about 20 years ago now, the commission had commissioned for, uh, they had it written for the libraries in Nebraska to use. Um, it's really very good. It gives a lot of good advice. You might want to look at it even if you don't follow all of the things they say. Um, but it's maybe a little bit more extensive than our quick plan here. Uh, the new planning for results from Sandra Nelson. It's amazing. But she makes a banquet out of planning. And she does a if you followed her, you would have a fabulous plan when you were done. But we were kind of going through more for a drive through window approach. Um, we just, we need to get it done. In a way that still works for people. Um, we also, we do have an example here of the five-year plan that the Nebraska Library Commission itself does fill out. We are required to do this by the Institute of Museum and Library Services from whom all federal funds flow. And so uh, we too do do our planning. We have goals and objectives. Um, ours has to be done in a slightly different way because of their requirements, but uh, still, you know, we do one. So what we want to know now, okay. Richard wants to tell some stories. Oh, he has some great illustrations here. You can't leave without hearing some stories. And uh, Laura mentioned yesterday that we were at uh, Columbus Public Library, and Jill, the library director, was talking about their strategic planning that they did. But we have used what happened in Columbus as an example of how you can distinguish between community needs and library responses. Because you'll notice that when she was running you through the SWOT analysis, the strengths and weaknesses, and then opportunities and threats, she said strengths and weaknesses are for consideration of the library. They are internal. 
When you look at the opportunities and threats, you look external to the library. That's a handy distinction because there tends to be a messing of those up if you don't sort of distinguish between internal and then external. But what happened in Columbus some years ago is that they were having a problem, and Jill verified this yesterday, uh, they were having a problem with teens and tweens because there's a, there's a middle school about two blocks away from the library itself. And a lot of those kids, as is true in a lot of our communities, were uh, at loose ends after school and before their parents came home. Uh, I don't know if you call them latchkey kids or whatever you call them, but basically uh, they had no place to go or no place that they were interested in going. So two of the places that they gathered were a burger joint across the street from the public library and in front of the public library itself. And what they were doing was being teens and tweens, they were very active, they were kind of pushing and shoving, and there's gravel of, of rocks of fairly large size in front of the library. They were, was worried about they'd start throwing it at each other and break a window or whatever. And right next door to the public library, there's a senior center. And the seniors, many of them are uh, ambulatory, and so they'd come over to the library. They were afraid to come into the library. They were afraid that they'd get knocked over, and I think that was a very real threat. So the community itself knew that it had a problem. This wasn't just the library's problem or the burger joint's problem. This was a community problem. But the library decided to try to do something about that, and what they did was... They formed a young adult advisory group, which they hadn't had before, uh, working with their young adult librarian. They uh, moved some shelving out of the second floor of a library elsewhere and created a teen space in the library itself. They bought teen-friendly uh, furniture and worked with this advisory group to come up with things that the kids would like. They let the kids paint the area themselves. It's wild, believe me. It's very different looking. And what happened was, as Jill verified yesterday, they don't have that problem anymore. Neither does the burger joint across the street. The teens have a place to go that they themselves had an opportunity to have input on, and they felt valued. Now, here's an example of the library happened to respond, but they actually helped the community as a whole solve a community need. It wasn't just the library need. Now, they happen to get perhaps uh, more opportunity to meet and work with teens, which is a benefit that the library got, but that wasn't the, the basis for doing this whole thing. It was to address a community need. They also have added a monitor position. The community gave them additional money to have a monitor there between uh, the end of the school year uh, day, excuse me, and the time the kids go and are picked up by their parents. And so they actually got some additional staff. The staff does not do any library programming. The staff is just there to monitor the situation, and it helped address a community need. And the other story that I've been telling to people is a little bit more, uh, you might think it's far-fetched, but it is a true story, and that has to do with rat poison in St. Louis. Years ago when I was working at the Missouri State Library, and so for so, those of you who went to uh, uh, NLA conference last year, you may have heard this story already, but when I was working with the Missouri State Library years ago, uh, I heard a story that was a true story about uh, people within the city of St. Louis who were having problems with rats in the town. And for those of you who know St. Louis, it's right along the river. Uh, it's a very urban area. There are some parts of the city that are not in very good shape and so forth. And uh, they were starting to have a rat problem and were concerned about it from a health perspective. Well, they wanted to distribute rat poison to people to use in their areas where they lived. But they wanted to distribute it to people, and the city offices that would have distributed closed at 5 o'clock, and most people worked till 5 o'clock. Well, they worked it out that the public library branches in St. Louis, and I think there are about 13 or so of them, perhaps more, would actually become the distribution points for that rat poison for distribution to the public because they're open weekends, they're open evenings, when the city offices were not open. So there's a situation where you don't consider that obviously something that the library might consider to do, but it actually was addressing a community need. Now, 
Laura showed you a slide earlier on, and the reason, and she hit this very heavily, so you should have gotten the message, the reason that we want you to look at statistics about communities, to talk to people about communities, to get outside the library, to talk to other people, to make observations as if you haven't lived in that community for yay on the number of decades, whatever it is, is because you need to try to look at the community with fresh eyes. Our expectation is that when you look at those statistics on American Fact Finder, or you talk to people who are new to town, or you talk to non-users of your library, or you talk to people from a different cultural background, that you're going to find out stuff you didn't know if you listen and look with an open mind. And if you do that, then by doing that as apart from considering whether we have the resources in the library to address that, if you consider it apart from it and you look with new eyes, with fresh eyes, at what your community needs are, even if you think you already know your community, take a look at it again. Then you can come back and work with your planning group, board members, planning group members, people from outside. You can work with them and say, okay, now what is our library in a unique position to address of those needs? There is a, on worksheet three, there is, a, can we go back to worksheet three for just a minute? Can we still do that? Are we still live? Yeah. Go to the, no, go to the next one over to the left. Just go to the left one. Where, you have over there. Over there. there. Yeah, which worksheet? Oh, worksheet three. Okay, if you go down to the second page of that, you'll notice on that page, on the second page of worksheet three, that what we are recommending that you do when you're looking around to figure out what community needs are, that you actually keep a tally of those needs. And as you go through there, you say, oh, Ten people mentioned that the houses in town aren't kept up by people. Uh, eight people mentioned that there are dogs wandering around town. Six people mentioned that the streets are potholed. Whatever it is, you put all the needs on a chart and you start tallying behind it. And those that come up with the most tally marks, you put number one. And the next most, number two. Number three, number four. And then when you're working with your planning group, you say, okay, these are needs that we have identified in our community and that people in this community have identified. Now, which of these might we want to address? And here's one last story. Some years ago, I was working at Southeast Library System as the system administrator there before I came here to the Nebraska Library Commission. And I did a strategic planning process with a very small town. That town wanted to either build a new library or add on to the library that they had. So we did a SWOT analysis of the community, and what they came up with, they said the greatest need that this community has identified is for meeting place. We have no place in town where we can hold meetings. Zip. The library wasn't big enough, no other place in town was available for meetings. So they decided that this was their number one priority as they were planning their new building. They worked with an architect, they worked with some planners, they were given a price tag associated with that new library or renovated library, and they found out that they didn't have as much money or they'd have to raise more money than they thought they could raise in that town to do it. So I worked with them again. I said, all right, what are you going to do to address this, uh, this gap, this need that you have because you can't get enough money to do what you want to do? And the first thing that they decided to do was to eliminate the meeting room from their planned library. And I waited for just a minute and I looked at them and I said, wait a minute, what did you identify as the number one need in your community? And they said, a place for meeting. I said, well, why on earth then would you cut that out first thing in your plan? That's the kind of disconnect that people make if they don't say, okay, here are the needs, here's what we're in a unique position to address, here's how we're going to do it, here are our plans, What's our mission statement? All those sorts of things together. That would prevent your making a decision like that, which was really not a very bright decision. And they saw that that was silly, given the fact that they had already determined that that's the greatest need in the community. That connection between needs in the community that you identify and responses on the part of the public library is what strategic planning is all about. Because the word strategic has within it the word strategy. You're developing a strategy. You're coming up with a plan that will, do, that will actually deliver the biggest bang for the buck that you're doing. And you're using the public bucks to do this. So you better be really good at doing your planning and making your decision and thinking strategically. 
And that's what we're talking to you about today. And I'll give it back to Laura now. Okay. Okay. Now, finally, we want to ask you, okay, have, has this program achieved the goals we had for it? Remember, at the beginning of the program, Richard talked about what our goals were, what we wanted. And so, are you more familiar now with the new accreditation guidelines than you were before? You know where they are on our website, so you can take a look at them. But you've kind of run through them now. You have sort of an idea of how they look. Um, do you understand how the guidelines and the strategic plan relates? How the guidelines are really based on the idea of are you doing in your community what you think your community needs? Do you understand how you can use the guidelines for planning? Because the guidelines show what's going on in your community. And do you understand how the guidelines can be used as benchmarks because the guidelines use a um, comparison with peer libraries to uh, determine whether you're meeting goals or not. So those are the questions that we'd really uh, like to know. We So let us know. You know, send us an email. Um, or put something right now in the questions. Uh, we'd really like to know if this was useful to you or not. And if you have further questions, please let us know that. Um, we really want you to be able to uh, have a successful experience with this planning. And we, we would love to see you all get accredited. I want a lot of gold libraries, OK? <laughs> we're, we're all going for the gold here, OK? <laughs> The other thing to mention to you is that each of your system administrators in each of the six systems is more than willing to work with you on these strategic plans, and we're more than willing. Think of those people because they are really revved up to do this. Uh, they helped with all this planning. They helped do the videos. They helped do the presentations and so forth. And Laura and I are here today, but they know as much about this as we do, and they're more than happy to talk to you about it. So give them a call. If you don't know which system you're in, let us know. We'll tell you. Thank you. Thank you. So, do we have any questions or anything? Um, not right this minute. Um, if you have any questions, type it in the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. And um, uh, Richard and Laura can answer it, not me. Okay. <laughs> um, no, there wasn't anything that came in during the, during the webinar. Okay. Or during the workshop either. People, I guess, are... Paying attention, learning. Either that or they're stunned. <laughs> we will do one. We will put one, a couple more things up on the website. One of the things is that uh, last year we had uh, strategic plans that were submitted, and probably the best one was from the Shelby Community Library in Shelby, Nebraska. We'll put that up on the website. You will see that they basically followed all those steps. You'll see that uh, they followed all those guidelines. They have a wonderful section that talks about the people that they involved in their planning committee. It's really good. Take a look at it. It's not feasible for me for us to do a verbal description of it, but we will have it up on our website from Shelby Community Library. Um, no, we just have a comment. Wanda says, it has helped me understand how to go about our accreditation. So good. I guess one of those questions was, yes, good. <laughs> one of those end questions. Thank you, Wanda. <laughs> Glad to hear it. <laughs> Makes it a success. Anything? Sign off. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.